The nation of Israel had a habit of rebelling against God. And one day they created a serpent and stuck it up on a stick. That rebellion was actually led by someone we wouldn't expect. God. The people who rebelled against God, and what had happened is, after they rebelled against God, God sent serpents, fiery serpents, he calls them, poisonous snakes. And they were biting the people. And they prayed to God and they said, deliver us from these fiery serpents. And he said, okay, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a bronze serpent, stick it up on a stick and raise it up. And whenever anybody's bitten, they'll look upon this serpent. And if they look upon it, they won't die. Well, what happens by the time that we've had a few kings and things have gone a little further away than it was supposed to is in 2 Kings, they had to remove this serpent. This serpent that God had commanded them to put up, they had to remove. Because what happened was people were no longer looking at it and going, God, heal me from this bite. They were looking at this and actually worshiping it. Now think about it. God commanded them to put something up. It was good. It was holy. God said do it. But by the time a few generations had gone by, something that was holy and good had become a source of idolatry. A source of sin. A cause for the people to stumble. So the king, wanting to return the people, took down what God had commanded to be put up. Because they had taken something, turned it into something it wasn't, and it became an idol. As we look at 1 Corinthians 1, we're going to see three different idols in this chapter. Three different idols that are destroying the division. The idol of self. Wisdom. And people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Now I exert you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, beyond that I do not know whether I baptized any others. He commands them very strong. He says, have no divisions among you. Be of the same mind, the same judgment. But what were they doing? They were taking their leader. Take that card just a second. How many of us have ever looked at the one we saw as our model for our faith? The one we saw, they taught us, and it's one of those, if we ever did anything we would think about it. We would go, would they approve of it? I, I have a model. Mine wasn't my grandmother. It was Mama Landrum. I've used this phrase before. I called her mom because we were close. She taught me that church could be about the Bible. And throughout time, I've come to question a lot of things that I learned there. Because she was extremely, extremely conservative. This is one of those, if you ever preached and you didn't use three points in a poem, you just slipped. You're on the slippery slope. You're going to probably go to hell. It's just, it's leading there. You're not there yet, but it's close. One day I came to her and uh, I was discussing with her because I got in trouble in another class. So I went to her. She said, well, you know, she's a Democrat. That's a slippery slope. And I was like, is everything a slippery slope with you? Yes. Okay, uh, you know there's uh, people talking. Of, talking leads to other things. Okay. And it was, all, it was all slippery slope with her. And I respected her 
But any time I ever wanted to change or I wanted to go closer to God, I would do something. I would reread this passage and I wasn't using Paul or Cephas or Apollos. I was saying, I am of Mama Landrum. Has Mama Landrum been baptized? Was Mama Landrum my model? The honest fact is yes, she was. And there was this sense where I didn't want to let her down. And, and most, hopefully you've written a name down. And the problem is names are great. And someone leading you to God and drawing you closer to God is great. But so was the bronze serpent. It was great. But it can become an idol. Things that are supposed to be holy can become idols. Think about the 16th century. You had monks. Monks would go in and pray. And they would pray so much that they never came out of their monastery. They never helped anyone. They never served God. They just prayed. And something as holy as prayer just became a reason not to share God with the world. But we wouldn't say that prayer is evil. I... How many, I stole this sign from upstairs. It was hidden. The Church of Christ. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I love the way that we started so different than everybody else. We started out because two guys got together and they said, you know what? We're going to go back to the Bible. We, we think that things can be done in such a way that they can be done exactly. Did y'all hear that too or is it in my head? Just making sure. I appreciate it. Don't worry. Trust me. I thought it was in my head for a little bit. And it's like, I really have gone crazy. Okay. Well, it's enjoyable. The Church of Christ was started and they said, let's go back to the Bible. And that was their whole emphasis was, we're going to do things, Bible things in Bible ways. And we're going to have unity. Because we're not going to fight over all this stuff because we're just going to go back to the Bible. And then you have to ask your que yourself this question. Have you ever heard the term Church of Christ used as a descriptor? Okay. If you can't say that's not in the Bible, then that's probably not how they intended to use the word Church of Christ. They say the Church of Christ doesn't do that. If the whole point of the Church of Christ was to go back to the... Bible, then what should you say if you think something is wrong? That's not in the... But yet, I've heard it so many times, somebody will say, well, the Church of Christ doesn't do that. You've just made it something it was never intended to be. It was something that was great. It had this perfect goal of going back to the Bible and just following God and making it simple. It was all about whom? Christ, right? The Church of Christ. It's just a little hint in there. And it became a descriptor, and they took something that was holy and a great thing, and they started using it in such a way that it took away from saying, well, the Bible says. And you'll see it today. You'll hear people say, the Church of Christ tradition. The Church of Christ tradition is this. We follow the Bible. Now, you want to talk more about the tradition, you better go to the Bible now. But there's a second way in which we do this. Starting in verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. 
but we preach Christ. Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So often we will look at the Bible and you and me can come to the Bible. And the, the idea is God gave it to us. And if God is so perfect, then if God gives us a book, then logically you and me can sit down and read it together. You and me can sit down and come to the same conclusion and we don't need a special wisdom. What happened in the book of 1 John was you had a bunch of people who were called the Gnosticists. Big fancy word. It happens to be in Greek and it sounds weird. Gnosticists. It means knowledge. They had something special you just didn't get. I know you were reading your Bible. You just couldn't figure it out. They forgot to tell you that Jesus really wasn't physical. That was all just, you know, figurative. And the problem was that they were going to the Bible and they were going, yeah, it says that. Let me tell you about the secret wisdom that I have. Let me tell you about how I secretly know something that you don't and can't get from reading the Bible. This is a good time to shut off your ears. Whenever you hear this, you go, well, let me tell you what the Bible says, but let me tell you what it really means. That's mysticism, Gnosticism. And it's this secret wisdom. It's this, well, let me tell you, I've taken the Bible, which is God's wisdom, and I've said through my foolishness, I'm going to reinterpret it through human wisdom, and then you're going to get something completely different. Oh, whoa. And in this, wisdom becomes this, well, I know a lot. So you know what that means? I know more than you. Well, the problem is, you and me open the same book. You and me can come to the Bible and come to the same conclusions. And if we can't, then we need to change what we believe. We need to be able to go to the Bible and say, you know what the Church of Christ stands for? We're going to do Bible things, Bible ways, and it's all going to be different. And we're going to be united and there will be no division because nobody's going to have this special wisdom. Nobody's going to stand up on a hill or a golden throne or sit in Rome and go, let me tell you what it really means. We're not going to have a convention. We're not going to have a Southern Baptist Convention, General Baptist Convention, Methodist Hall, Presbyterian Council. We're not going to have one of those because we're going to say we don't even need those guys. We're going to go to the Bible. We're going to work together. We're going to be one. And we're going to come to a conclusion and go, that's what it says. But it takes this last step. Verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The last idol we must crush is the one that comes into effect in all the others. Self. We've talked about three different idols that can keep us from the unity that we need. Because you think about it just a second. If you are sitting over there going, I read wineskins and I read new paths. I don't know if I switched y'all out, sorry. And you're sitting there and you're going, well, old wine says this and I follow this guy. And this one's over here saying, well, I read this one and I follow this guy. We aren't going to agree. There is no possible way to take multiple pieces, throw them together and say, now you have to agree. But if we come together and we say, God gave us the word, all scriptures God breathed. And we believe that. 
We believe that in reality, God gave us the book and he's not stupid. Too often we come to the book and we say, well, God just can't figure out how to say it to us. Well, let me tell you what God would say if God was all powerful and knew what to say. Let me tell you this. God is all powerful and he knows what to say. Sometimes I get confused. But if we all came to it and we said the Bible is where we're going to stand, no tradition will stand. No teacher will stand. No special wisdom. And my ability to tell you what it really meant would disappear. But that'd be very humbling, wouldn't it? If I said you go to the Bible and I go to the Bible, we should come. We should agree. We should come to the Bible and neither one of us has any place to stand before God. And he tells us his word. And we have no right to reinterpret it. Scripture says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. It is breathed by the Holy Spirit. It is perfect and holy. And if we came to it and we treated it and we said, God, you are great and I am nothing Nothing is actually more than me. I love that phrase in here. God takes nothing, makes it something. So nothing is literally more than me with God. Literally, if God wants to take the emptiness and make it greater than me, it's, it's done. Because he's God. Because he is all wise. And he sent us his son. That showed us what real wisdom was. Christ says he doesn't do his will. He only seeks to do what pleases his father. And if we came to Christianity the same way and we said we're just seeking to please you and do what you've told us to do. We're here to carry out your mission. Not change it, not modify it, not be anything we aren't. If we remove that idol, then we could be one, as he speaks of. One without division, one without fighting over judgments, but we would be of the same mind. In Galatians, he challenges to be one. He says that for all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Today we offer an invitation of that, that oneness, that Christ came. He offered the invitation. Christ came and said to believe in him. Christ tells us to repent of our sins. Christ tells us to confess him. Christ tells us to be baptized into him. And Christ tells us to live for him. And there is nothing greater than God and in the form of Christ. He commanded us to come to him. If there's anybody who is not united with Christ and has no hope, because only hope comes through that foolishness, which is, the cross of Christ. Or if there's anybody who needs prayers, or if anybody wants to submit to the eldership here, we ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing.